Okay, so hello everybody and thanks for joining us. Today, of course, we're talking about ransomware. Uh, probably safe to say that this is the number one threat facing organizations today. We certainly see a lot of coverage in the media. The media tends to focus on the big stories though, such as the colonial pipeline incident. And what that doesn't tell you is the sheer scale of the problem. This problem is facing organizations of all sizes across all industries. And when a ransomware attack does happen, the financial impact can be critical to an organization's ongoing activities. So what's really needed is the ability to interrupt these attacks at every stage of the cyber kill chain. And we do that using something that we call autonomous response. So let's first paint the story in pictures and, and numbers. You know, what are the statistics around ransomware that we should be aware of? And we can start with the bottom left here. We know that on average, year on year, we have actually seen a 518% increase in the number of ransomware payments that are being made. So more and more organizations are choosing to make those payments. Now, the payments themselves per incident are, again, on average, about $170,000. So we are talking significant amounts of money involved. But money is not the end of the story here because it's more than money. It's about the business being able to operate. And typically, the businesses affected by ransomware attacks do suffer an average downtime of about 21 days following that ransomware attack. And that means that for 21 days, the business is unable in some way to meet its customer obligations and to serve its customers. Now, the average cost is actually greater than the ransomware uh, amount being paid. So there's a lot of other things involved, including that downtime and other things come together. And the total amount comes to an average of about $1.85 million. And that's the cost of recovering from the ransomware attack. So we know that these are happening a lot. We know that there's businesses being impacted and there's significant financial outlay involved as well. So this tells us that it is a serious threat that we need to start planning for so that we can actually hopefully prevent, if not mitigate, when we do see this happening. So let's talk about the stages involved. What sort of stages does a typical ransomware attack go through? Now, for simplicity, we're boiling it down to three. We've got the initial stages, followed by the middle stages, and then the data exfiltration that we all understand so well. And this initial intrusion is how the attacker gets its entry point into the victim's environment. Quite often, this is through phishing emails, which we've heard a lot about in recent times, You know, seeing these emails that entice us to click on a link or open an attachment. It could be brute forcing our way onto servers, you know, RDP servers, for example, and trying to guess usernames and passwords until one works. Uh, or it could be taking advantage of vulnerabilities in websites. And we do see these reported in the news, so they're quite easy to investigate and discover. But once they're on those end, end machines, they don't want to sit still. They actually want to move around. And we call this lateral movement. So moving from device to device looking for interesting sort of things like your servers, for example, or sensitive information that they might want to take advantage of. Now, they also engage in what we call command and control beaconing. So they're reporting what they're doing to attackers hosting infrastructure out on the internet, and they're also asking for commands. You know, we found this, now what's the next sort of activity we should be engaging in? And that's how they get their commands to follow. And at the same time, they're staging data, they're finding interesting information, they're either exfiltrating it or they're moving it so they've got it in one place when they want to take action on it. And the data encryption, we all understand quite well. This is what makes the stories in the newspapers. So it is very difficult to disrupt, uh, to, to stop, sorry, without disruptive programming. And that means being really heavy with your firewall rules preventing access to file servers, for example. And that's just not going to allow the organization to work as intended. We have to enforce what we call the pattern of life, the normal business operations. 
And it's impossible to do that using traditional signatures. They're never going to see new, unusual things that are evolving in real time. We also have to take action directly or through integration. So if you've got existing firewalls in your environment, being able to tell those firewalls to temporarily block certain activity to safeguard the organization and prevent that damage from getting worse. So essentially, we want to stop the attack before it gets worse. We want to learn about the business. What is good? What is bad? What does that look like in terms of network activity? And then, of course, we want to take action on the events and take whatever action is necessary. So if something's beaconing out to a certain website, being able to block access to that website for as long as required. Now, I want to talk about a specific case study here, a threat find we made involving sophisticated ransomware in a customer's environment. And the timeline on the left-hand side, the sequence of events, really tells an interesting story here. We see that they gained an initial foothold, and that was observed because we saw beaconing or connections being made out to rare IP addresses on the internet that had never been contacted by this organization before. From there, they engaged in internal reconnaissance. They performed network scanning, seeing what other devices were in that network. And from there, they moved laterally. They jumped from machine to machine. They took action to actually create new services. And we saw some unusual administrator logins, those credentials being used on servers that didn't look normal, according to that pattern of life that we were talking about. So what's interesting to note here is that the time between that initial foothold and the reconnaissance was literally 11 minutes. Now, 11 minutes, if you're going through logs, if you're going through multiple dashboards, trying to figure out, are we under attack? Is there anything I should be following up on? That's time you don't have the luxury of if you're suffering an imminent ransomware attack. So we need to be automating this as much as possible. This attack also made use of a technique we, we call living off the land. And living off the land means that they're not bringing their own malware tools, but they're taking advantage of the tools already on the machines that they've taken control over. So Windows PowerShell, for example, that's not a malicious tool, but it can be used for malicious purposes. And we also restore or maintain normal business operations without disruption. So we're certainly going to disrupt the attack, but we don't want to disrupt the business. And that means that they, they don't get put in the position where they suffer those financial impacts. So looking at this in more detail, the initial intrusion. This was an environment where we were monitoring 5,000 endpoints for a customer. And we saw some unusual activity. We saw some virtual desktops making some very suspicious HTTP and HTTPS connections to destinations on the internet that they had never contacted before. Nothing in that organization had ever contacted these destinations before. And the patient zero, that first infected machine, really tells the story when you start looking at the, the screenshot here. The screenshot is the dashboard showing the alerts that warrant follow-up activity. Now, the closer these alerts are to red, the more severe they are. You can see they're all bunched very, very tightly together, yellow to red, so they're all high impact, all high severity. This dashboard is literally screaming at the analyst saying, we have an incident here. This is everything I'm finding. It all looks related. We need you to take follow-up activity, please. So there's really no mistaking this. From there, the reconnaissance and the lateral movement happens next. The reconnaissance, we see some ICMP scans on ports that tell us it's probably looking for other Windows machines that it can start moving to. And that's exactly what happens next. We see that movement. We see new service controls created over SMB. And that means it's trying to create new activities, new processes on the machines that it's moving to. On top of that, we're seeing temporary admin accounts being used to access other domain controllers. And the fact that we're seeing the logins with administrator accounts coming from virtual desktops to the domain controllers themselves all looks very unusual considering what we've established as normal activity 
in this environment. So this is all painting the story of everything unfolding in terms of the attack and everything we're seeing so we can stitch these incidents and these activities together. Now, the Cyber AI Analyst Dashboard is where everything comes into one place. You've got eyes on everything from a single screen. So at the very top, you see the timeline. You see the actual incidents, where they appear chronologically, and how severe or strict those incidents are. Down the middle here, we've got a summary of the event in real plain English, what is going on. We've got the specific model breaches that have been picked up and triggered to actually bring this to our attention and some potential actions we can take if we're an analyst working on this event. We've also got additional information, so additional suspicious endpoints that our infected machine is trying to talk to on the internet. That's all going to come in really handy for follow-up activity. And on the left here, we can see all of the stages of the cyber kill chain and exactly which stages map to the actual incidents and events that we're seeing as part of this attack. So you really do have everything in one place. You don't need to, need to waste time and effort going across different dashboards, trying to stitch things together. All of that work has been done for you. So what we do is we actually protect across the entire digital estate. And this is where Dark Trace comes into the picture. So our self-learning AI is the ability of understanding what we were referring to as that pattern of life. What is the concept of self? What does normal look like? And then what is not normal for a given environment? It's continuously learning, continually updating as it sees new traffic. And this means that instead of relying on signatures that can't catch new threats, it can catch zero days. It can catch novel malware or ransomware. Now, you also need to be able to take response, and we call this autonomous response. And that means that we're taking very specific actions to neutralize that ransomware. So if it's trying to talk to a destination on the internet on a certain port, for example, we can stop that in real time for as long as required to remediate that infection. This happens at machine speed. We're not relying on analysts taking minutes or hours to identify and react to things. And we can also keep the business up and running because we understand what normal is. We make sure that that normal operations are allowed to continue while we actually step in and take action against the malicious activity. And the cyber AI analyst here is again, what we just saw in that last screenshot. So automatically investigating incidents, giving you a summary of exactly what's going on in plain English, which is using natural language processing and actually putting its findings into an English written report that your analysts can read or even take to management to understand what this attack actually was. And the actual time taken to triage these events using this platform is a 92% saving on the time used unless you weren't using this. So using traditional SIEM platforms, logging platforms, for example, it really does expedite the triage time involved. Now we do this across all of your environment. If you're in the cloud, we've got you covered. If it's email, same story. We're on the network, the, the, the endpoints, all of your applications, and even OT, if that's somewhere that you, you operate in as well. So wherever you are, we're there with you, keeping you safe from these threats as they unfold. Now, I also want to point out, we do have a really, really good blog that I would encourage you to visit because you can see on our blog, if we're looking at ransomware specifically, we do have a subheader there. You can click on ransomware and look at all of the stories of ransomware attacks. We've discovered in different real world environments, how we discovered it, what was unusual about it, what actions we took and how we can keep those customers safe. And by extension, we can also keep you safe facing any of these similar threats or other things that we haven't seen before because we separate normal activity from abnormal activity. So definitely worth having a look. Interesting reads there. I'm sure you'll probably learn something and have a good time reading through some of those stories as well. So with that, I really do wanna thank you. We do have a 30-day proof of value 
That's an offer, uh, no obligation. If it's something you did want to have a look at, details there on the screen on how to request that if it's something you are interested in. And again, I want to thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you very much.